important. I'm a historian, so I'm, I'm not surprised by that because you had this great era of um, educational expansion and institution building from the late 19th century with the expansion of the high school, the creation of associations in the content fields like English and history and things like that, you know, sort of culminating in uh, mass education becoming what most people did in the United States in school districts, you know, going to schools, you know, with curriculum and professionals overseeing them. And this Department of Curriculum and Teaching came into being during that time, in sort of the latter part of that time, in the 1920s and moving into the 30s. And so the Sachs Lecture is very much an expression of the potential of rethinking education, you know, rethinking where we're going, and trying to plan and design and con you know, consider some kind of set of values and, and theories and research that can help to make productive a massive effort in schooling. And my only comment is, here we are again, this is the Sachs Lecture, and we're trying to look to the future and think about our potential in preparing teacher educators. And I'll pass it to Lucy Calkins from there. I can't imagine a more important question than the question of preparing teacher educators and particularly the role of teacher education universities at this time. And it has been our great fortune to have a series of people come um, to help to raise provocative questions, to depress us. Um, uh, the nice thing is now as we turn towards the conclusion of the series, we have just one more time, which will be April, 7, 8, April 18th. Um, we're, um, we're, we're looking forward to, to trying to think about um, about the, the the upbeat, the positive, as well as as well as the the scary and the frightening. Um, uh, tonight, um, uh, it's my great honor to introduce David Berliner to you, um, and and David is going to be taking up the question of evaluating teacher education um, based on student assessments, um, and it's a kind of timely question because this very night the state legislature is voting on evaluating not teacher education, but evaluating teachers um, based on student assessments. Everybody, I think, knows that New York State is considering having 50% of teacher evaluation be based on student scores, and the other 35% based on an independent evaluator who swoops through a school briefly, um, leaving 15% up to the principal. Um, so as we sit here, the the, the, the force of our attention, um, let, it, let, it be a, let our minds be powerful and, and may we send brave brain waves uh, to, the, to the legislators um, uh, to, to um, help with this question. So, so who is this David who's taking on such a Goliath? Um, uh, he, uh, he, most of you, many of you know him. He has taught, uh, especially at University of Arizona, but also UMass, Stanford, and TC. Um, he's very well known as the author of The Manufactured Crisis, um, uh, which um, was a book that, that turned all of our um, thinking upside down about 10 years ago. And his more recent book, um, 50 Myths and Lies That Threaten America's Public Schools, um, The Real Crisis in Education, um, a TC Press book, which will be sold after tonight, and you can get it signed. I just want to read a few of the little clips on the back of this book. Um, Andy Hargreaves writes, this book is true grit. It's the gritty reality of hard data. It's the irritating grit that makes you shift in your seat, and it's the grit that sometimes makes you want to weep. Um, and Linda Darling-Hammond um, points out that the book, that, that Berliner in this book continues his record of evidence-based truth-telling. Um, <laughs> So uh, David and I visited a school yesterday together, and I learned a little bit about him that you may not know. Um, his first job was driving an ice cream truck here in New York. Um, uh, I loved the image of him as Mr. Softy. Um, uh, TC Press had pointed out to me that their description of him is that he's a real mensch. Um, so I thought that the Mr. Softy um, image wasn't exactly that kind of ice cream truck. But then he also started his first business here in, in New York. Oh, I asked him, what was that business? Uh, it was a local bar and grill. Um, and he said, I loved it because all these kind of quirky, interesting people. And that was really what started me off studying psychology. So David, this is kind of another bar and grill filled with quirky, interesting people. And we are really dying to hear um, how you help us to think about preparing teacher education um, as, a, as, a, as a topic, um, and particularly the topic that's so very much on our minds tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you all for coming out in the rain, <laughs> in the snow. Um, uh, this is a special for me, uh, uh, 
This is the second time I've done the Sachs Lecture, the third time I've been kind of in residence at uh, Teachers College, and its hallowed halls uh, always make me feel good because so much history took place here. Um, it's also where the book, The Manufactured Crisis, was first introduced was in, at Teachers College, and so I have a special uh, warmth here. Um, also, I am an ex-New Yorker, so anybody else who wants to invite me and my wife to come to New York, we are available. Um, <laughs> We love the city. Um, anyway, uh, as an ex-New Yorker, um, I, I will go back to my New York roots and not mince any words. Um, evaluating teachers and teacher education by means of the scores students obtain on standardized achievement tests. The policy promoted by Secretary of Education Duncan, supported by President Obama, and adopted by Governor Cuomo is ridiculous. My 12 reasons for such a harsh judgment are what I want to share with you. So it'll take a while to run through this. I have 12 reasons. In fact, last night I found a 13th. I may or may not get to it, but uh, we'll see. So it'll take a little while for me to run through this. The primary reason that student standardized test performance cannot be used to evaluate teacher education programs, nor the teachers they produce, is that those tests do not measure much about a teacher's effects on students. What? Did I just say that tests do not measure teachers' effects? No, I did not say that. I said that teachers' effects are barely noticeable on standardized tests of achievement. Of course, it sounds convincing to parents and legislators alike to say university professors and classroom teachers will offer their students an appropriate curriculum. We expect that. And when exposed to an appropriate curriculum, their students will learn the knowledge and skills desired of them. And of course, we can assess the students' learning of what we desire of them through a traditional and well-accepted technique, namely student scores on reliable and valid standardized tests. Each of these three points, which is the logic of the system, has problems. First, we have learned that what teachers teach is rarely the same as what the standardized test designers think they teach. That is, the enacted curriculum bears only a limited resemblance to the curriculum desired by various governing agencies, which is what test developers use as their guide for designing the tests. Albany may specify the test, Pearson may write the items, but teachers teach, and what they teach does not overlap greatly, according to Polakoff, Porter, and lots of others. Second, what students learn is not controlled by teachers, but by the students themselves. I'll elaborate on that. And third, inferences about students' knowledge and skill derived from standardized achievement tests may be reliable and valid, but inferences about teachers' competency derived from the same data is neither reliable nor valid. Thus, when standardized achievement tests are used to judge teacher competency, and then those data are used to judge institutional excellence, we have invalidity squared. Secretary Duncan got my attention a few years ago when he gave some high-profile speeches in which he said teacher education was, quote, doing a mediocre job, unquote. I thought then, as I do now, that he has no real evidence for that chain charge. Some of, of his beliefs were shaped by a report from the former president of Teachers College, Art Levine. Levine's critique of teacher education was interesting, though highly one-sided, not based on all the extant data, and certainly easily contested. A problem with teacher education is that it is so easy to, to criticize. I've done my share. But I usually add that we get pretty good value for the cost of such programs, since on almost all campuses, teacher education is one of the cheapest programs to run. Schools of education in Arizona and elsewhere, when we costed it out, subsidized the programs in computer science, biology, engineering, and in other expensive majors. We are the cash cows for other programs, and that needs to stop. Levine's report made many policy wonks happy. They liked the idea of abolishing teacher education or opening up private and alternative teacher education programs. Levine's critique allowed a program like Teach for America to claim that five weeks training was quite adequate since traditional programs of teacher education were so weak. Sensing an opportunity, Secretary Duncan announced plans for a revolutionary change in the evaluation of teacher education programs. The race to the top program he's crafted, Woody promised, quote, reward states that publicly report and link student achievement data to the programs where teachers were credentialed, unquote. He called for a shift in focus from examining program inputs and characteristics to looking primarily at program outputs. 
He promoted measuring program graduates' effectiveness in the classroom during their first few years of teaching by looking at the learning gains of their students. He proposed that this be done using value-added models of evaluation called VAMs, and every version of a VAM, no matter which one you hear about in different states, requires student assessment by means of standardized achievement tests. Those are the tests I contend have inadequate validity to make any believable inference about the quality of teachers or the programs that trained them. In one speech supporting his plan, Duncan proudly held up the example of Louisiana, the first state to have such a program put into place. I thought Louisiana was actually a great place to start because it has the lowest NAEP scores, National Assessment of Educational Progress, lowest NAEP scores in the country. Um, we can infer from scores so low on NAEP that Louisiana must have the least successful teacher training institutions in the country and the most incompetent teachers in the nation. Or at least that would be the secretary's conclusion given the logic of his thinking. But if what I said strikes you as an invalid inference from the extant data, you can see why I think the secretary's policy of evaluating teacher prep programs and classroom teachers with standardized tests is ridiculous. It really doesn't take much thought to come up with an alternative explanation of Louisiana's terrible level of achievement. Namely, that Louisiana is a terrible place in which to grow up poor. Louisiana's teacher preparation programs send most of their graduates to schools with some of the highest rates of childhood poverty in the nation. In addition, it's a state with one of the highest levels of inequality in the nation. When the secretary chooses to evaluate the state's teacher education programs and classroom teachers by means of standardized test scores, he blithely ignores who is taught in Louisiana and thus, of course, who is tested in Louisiana. In seeking to assign blame for students' low test performance, the secretary and the governor of Louisiana target the teacher education programs and teachers of the nation and the state. That seems to take the minds of politicians off the poverty and inequality that make Louisiana schools an embarrassment for our nation. In fact, the evaluation of teacher education and practicing teachers by means of VAMs and the standardized tests on which they rest appears to me to be a diversion of the type used by successful magicians. Blaming institutions and individual teachers for Louisiana's terrible NAEP scores directs our attention away from the inequality and poverty that actually give rise to such scores. In the same way a magician can divert the attention of an entire audience when they make a person or a rabbit disappear. Here are data relevant to this issue. You can see over on the left the percentage of teachers working in schools with more than 30% of students from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. 64% uh, of American teachers are in such schools. You will notice the rest of those are nations that are in the OECD in the PISA data. It's very simple to see. One group of teachers is teaching high numbers of kids in poverty. Um, among the many OECD nations participating in the PISA test, the US has the highest percentage of teachers working in schools where poverty rates uh, are high this way. Think about what this might mean given the secretary's logic. If poverty affects standardized test scores, and you all know it does, and you cannot completely control for that poverty statistically, which is always the case, then the teachers in poor schools will more often than not be falsely labeled incompetent. So the first of my 12 points is that when using standardized achievement tests as the basis for evaluating the quality of teachers or the institutions in which they were trained, it is too easy to confuse the effects that teachers have on standardized achievement test scores with the effects of some other very familiar external sociological influences on those scores. To sharpen the point, let's move from the teaching profession to other domains to see how odd it is to blame outcomes on those that are not proximal or direct causes of the problems identified. Suppose a distraught parishioner has been seeing his minister and subsequently commits suicide. Is the minister or the program that trained that minister in pastoral duties a failure? Perhaps, but characteristics of the parishioner are much more likely to be the decisive pack factor in determining what caused this failure of counseling. If one child kills another, do that child's parents ever go to jail? I sometimes wish that were the case, because there are some awful parents out there. But in law, unlike in Secretary of Duncan's world, we do not often hold people or institutions accountable for the actions of others. Certainly it is true that in some countries, families are called 
on to provide reparations if one of their children does something wrong. It is instructive that we often call those countries primitive. And our laws, Western laws, do not subscribe to that logic. So my second point is that the logic of holding schools of education responsible for student achievement does not fit into our system of law or into the moral code subscribed to by most Western nations. In fact, though most people do not realize it, there is no requirement that teaching lead to learning. Thus, holding teachers responsible for student learning can be challenged, although this appears too difficult a concept for the secretary and our president to understand. For example, if I go hunting or fishing and come home with neither a turkey nor a pike, was I hunting? Was I fishing? If I say I'm a salesperson, does that mean I hold a certain position in which certain behaviors are required of me? Or does it mean I actually get people to buy what I sell? If I spend my day teaching my dog to whistle and the stupid dog doesn't learn how to do so, was I teaching? My point is that teaching well or teaching poorly can be judged independent of whether or not students learn. This is a common confusion of the task meaning of the words hunting, fishing, selling, and teaching with the achievement meaning of the words. The linkage of these terms to the notion of achievement requires that turkeys or pike be brought home, that selling bring about a purchase, or that demonstrations of learning actually take place from teaching. But what is important here is that logically, good teaching and good teacher education can be judged independent of what it is that students learn. How might we do that? We could have experienced that respected senior teachers observe and evaluate classroom practices to judge the quality of teaching. They can judge the artifacts of life in a classroom, such as the quality of the tests given, the quality of the interactions of teachers and students, the nature of the teacher's responses to students' papers that were handed in, and the like. Artifacts from life in classrooms provide a reasonable set of indicators about teacher quality. In addition, the observations by principals and others, along with surveys of students and parents, can be sources of evidence to be used in making the very complex judgment about a teacher's competency. Students' standardized test scores are not needed for making judgment about quality teaching nor the quality of the teacher preparation programs from which the observed teachers came. Also, I should note that survey research is not without merit. We use it all the time, and we actually have many surveys from some of our most ambitious teacher training institutions attesting to the fact that a high percentage of recent college graduates felt well prepared for their first teaching jobs. And we have surveys of superintendents and principals that reveal large percentages who say that indeed those same teachers came to them well prepared as novices. So my third point is this. There are quite acceptable sources of data other than tests for judging the efficacy of teacher education programs and their graduates. But Governor Cuomo's plan won't do that well at all. Governor Cuomo's plan, as I understand it, will use tests in which we have problems, which I'll get into more. Um, he also wants one outside observer um, to come in. Now, I'm all for classroom observation, uh, but I did studies of generalizability many years ago in which we tried to figure out, can you, on one day, with one observer, reliably code teacher behavior? And the answer was that for a couple of teacher behaviors, yes, but for most of them, you might need as many as five observers on five different occasions in order to have the reliability high enough in order to make an inference about teacher quality. Here's an anecdote a teacher taught me uh, about how, how peculiar teacher behavior is day to day. Uh, uh, I was coding in a classroom higher order questioning by a teacher. And she was a very good teacher. She let me in her classroom all the time. And I went in there and I was coding that day and spent an hour or two listening to her, working with the kids. And I, 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 at the end of that time, the kids go out and she comes over to me and she said, did you get what you want, David? And I said, not today. Uh, she said, well, what were you looking for today? And I said, I was looking for higher order questions, high questions that get thoughts out by kids that, that have extended answers. And I said, I didn't get a single one today. And usually you're very good at that. And she said, oh, that's, that's, that's odd. And she turns away. And then I said, wait a minute, you know, talk about it. Why do you think today was different? And she says, oh, I don't know. And she looks around and she goes, oh, she says, it's raining. And she walks away. <laughs> and I said, uh, Barbara, Barbara, come back here, please. Uh, what do you mean it's raining? She says, well, 
you know, when it's raining, the kids don't get out to the playground. They don't run around. They don't use up their energy. If they don't use up their energy, I can't ask them higher order questions because it slows down the pace of the classroom. So I only ask lower order questions so I keep control of the pace. It's raining. I don't ask higher order questions. And she walks out. Okay? So if even the weather influences teacher behavior, how can you, with one observer on one day, get a reliable estimate? So the governor's really bizarre on that, you know, it, it makes no sense at all. Um, it, it, it's a validity issue because the reliability is so bad. Um, the New York plan is simply no good. I feel sorry for you all. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't come from a state that I'm going to hold up as a paragon either, okay? <laughs> Even more important and not talked about as much is the distinction between successful teaching and good teaching, a distinction the secretary appears not to understand. Teaching that successfully raises student standardized test scores through test preparation, increased homework, teacher merit pay, rewards for student performance, and the like may not be good teaching. Teaching that we think of as good teaching looks different. We see all around us the results of a success at any cost mindset. It's exemplified by Lance Armstrong, Alex Rodriguez, and others who took illegal substances to succeed. And it is the root of the cheating scandals associated with testing in the USA. In every one of the many, many cases of cheating on educational tests, we see evidence of teachers choosing successful teaching over good teaching. That's an error. In fact, it is precisely the distinction between successful education and good education for educating youth that's at the heart of the recent book by Yong Zhao, if you know it, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Dragon? There, Yong Zhao, who was raised in China and came to the US and won't go back to China, uh, there he describes how China has the best and the worst system of education at the same time. Their system is the best in the sense that it is remarkably successful in getting very high standardized test scores from its students. But it is not a very good system. It does not graduate creative, entrepreneurial, and community-minded citizens, as is more commonly found in the schools of the United States. So point four is this. Our government's reliance on standardized achievement test scores as the primary source of data about teacher quality will inevitably promote confusion between what we mean by successful instruction and what we mean by good instruction. This evening, in the hallowed halls of Teachers College, I bring to you a modern version of arguments that took place in this very institution between Dewey and Thorndike 100 years ago or so. Tom, that's uh, about right, OK? This, this, this is where those arguments uh, gain currency, and we still have them today. Let's look now at medicine and ask if medical schools ought to be held responsible for the condition of the patients cared for by their graduates. In terms of a system in need of reform, let me tell you, medicine is clearly it. Here are data on longevity. United States average life expectancy is 78.7 years. The OECD average is higher than that. They are living an average of 511 more days in the OECD than we do in America. Think of this like PISA scores, OK? They're, they're outscoring us. Only this is not metaphorically life and death. This is really life and death, OK? So uh, Belgium is living 657 more days. Finland and Ireland, Finland not only beats us, it, it's, they're living 694 days than we are. Canada, 840 more days. New Zealand, 900 more days. Norway, 1,100 more days. Israel, 1,100. Australia, 1,300. Up to Switzerland, they're living 1,497 more days than the typical American. And frankly, I'm angry over that, OK? <laughs> I want my family to have that life expectancy, too. Okay. What is clear to me is that America's medical schools must be terribly deficient since our physicians, compared to physicians in other countries, are not getting us to the benchmarks we aspire to in international competition. My interpretation of these data is just like the interpretation of the PISA scores that might be given by the New York Times. But the metric is in years lived rather than scores on reading, math, or science. But medicine is even worse than these data suggest. Survey was done, and where is that? 23%, almost a quarter of Massachusetts residents who were polled said they or someone they knew well, family member, was the uh, uh, recipient of a medical error. Medical errors of misdiagnosis, there were 51% of those. They were given the wrong test or the wrong surgery, 38% of the time. They're given wrong or unclear instructions about follow-up care, third of the time. 
give an incorrect medication, wrong doses or wrong judge a third of the time. They got an infection as a result of going there 32% of the time. <laughs> Current estimates are that as many as 40,000 deaths per year are caused by medical errors, almost 1,100 deaths a day, over 40 per hour. These deaths cost our nation about a trillion dollars a year, which is a third more than the total cost of public schooling in America. Why don't we here fire the doctors? Close the hospitals, close the medical schools, open charter hospitals. <laughs> if Arne Duncan was Secretary for Health and Human Services instead of Education, and listened carefully to economists such as Eric Hanyashek and Raj Chidi, as he seems to do, perhaps he would fire the bottom 5 or 10% of the physicians whose patients die younger than we would like. And to be consistent, he might also close the institutions that graduate the most physicians who serve the poor, since America's poor are the Americans who die the youngest. Thus, their physicians must be the worst physicians in the country. If I may pursue this analogy just a bit further, there are disturbing differences in how we treat longevity gaps in health compared to the achievement gaps we see in education. We have reliable evidence that family income and longevity are about as related and as causally related as is family income and standardized test performance. But recognition of that relationship is often assiduously ignored by educational policymakers who like to keep reminding us that poverty is no excuse. But why then does poverty seem quite acceptable as the reason for the huge gap in longevity when comparing upper income white people with lower income black people, Hispanics, or lower class white women whose longevity is actually going down? As near as I can tell, nobody is suggesting that the physicians who work with minorities and the poor are incompetent. No one is yelling at physicians to up their game to do better. No one seems to be demanding higher GRE scores of medical school applicants. No one is trying to close the medical schools from which these physicians came. And no one is proposing Heal for America so recent college graduates can spend <laughs> two years in an inner city emergency room. Groups of poor Americans are dying a decade or more before other groups of Americans, just as groups of Americans are achieving much lower standardized test scores than other groups of Americans. But poverty is regularly understood as the reason for the gap on the metric we use to judge physicians, yet poverty is often denied as the source of the gap we see in the metric we use to judge teachers. So a fifth point about the use of standardized achievement tests to evaluate teachers and the institutions that train them is that there is precedent for holding professionals harmless for their lower success rate with clients who have observable difficulties in meeting the demands and expectations of the professionals who attend to them. Now, my sixth point. It's related to a peculiar problem concerned to the evaluation of competence in both medicine and education. Each field, medicine and education, must accommodate a paradox that confuses policymakers and the public. Paradoxes are difficult to deal with. They often seem self-contradictory, as when I say that teachers and physicians have a huge influence on the lives of students and patients. And I also say that teachers and physicians don't have much influence on aggregated student standardized test scores or aggregated measures of longevity. It sounds as if both cannot be true at once, but they are. Let me explain this paradox by presenting an analogy. A few years ago, I went to my family physician for my annual physical checkup. He put a stethoscope on my chest and immediately looked perplexed. I asked him what was the matter, and he said it was noisy in there. He heard a lot of sloshing around, scared the hell out of me. He referred me to a heart specialist who repeated that test and agreed it was indeed very noisy in there. He ordered further tests and then informed me that I had a failing heart valve that needed to be fixed soon. I quickly had it attended to. I've been healthy for many years since. It is clear then that my family physician saved my life. But what effect did he have on longevity of Americans? What effect did he have on the death rate of white males in Arizona? What effect did he have on his rating in the local directory of best doctors in Phoenix? Probably none. These metrics simply do not reflect what my physician did, which was merely to save my life. As I showed you, on the metrics we ordinarily use to judge the competence of our physicians, they stink. American doctors and the related medical systems we use appear to be among the worst in the developed world, just as some say our educational system is among the worst in the developed world. But despite the metrics, wealthy people from all over the world come to the USA to use our hospitals and to bring their children to use our schools. Why would that happen? I think it's because the metrics we use do not provide the most meaningful data for judging the real achievements of professionals in our hospitals and our schools. Wealthy parents from all over the world seem to have figured this out. 
even if our government and our newspaper pundits, like Tom Friedman, have not. The rest of the world knows that whenever America has been willing to allocate the resources needed to care for its ill or its children, wonderful and successful institutions have been built. My family physician and his colleagues saved my life, while the metrics we use to ordinarily judge physician success hardly moved at all. This makes it quite clear that in medicine, you can save lives and not move metrics. Physicians seem to know that, but it's just as true in education as in medicine. You can literally save lives and not move education's commonly used metrics much at all. This paradox is described well in medicine by Dr. Danielle Offrey, an MD, PhD, a physician working near here, Mount Sinai Hospital, I think, writing in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. Just as a teacher might, physician Offrey says, quote, the quarterly report card sits on my desk. Only 33% of my patients with diabetes have glycated hemoglobin levels that are at goal. Only 44% have cholesterol levels at goal. A measly 26 have blood pressure at goal. All my grades are well below my institutional targets. It's not hard to feel like a failure when the numbers are so abysmal. We've been getting these reports for more than two years now, and my numbers never budge. It's wholly dispiriting, quote, unquote. She goes on to note, as might a reading teacher in a school serving poor families, quote, these measures focus on diabetes in pristine isolation. But my patients, inconveniently, carry at least five other diagnoses and routinely have medication lists in the double digits, unquote. Yes, Dr. Alfrey, you are right to complain. Numbers without context are mere, not merely useless, they mislead. Dr. Ofrey notes, like those in our teaching profession do, that every nurse and physician enters the field to be successful and do good things. And so the incompetence rate among these morally committed and dedicated professionals is actually remarkably low, though it happens. But the system that has been set up to find and remove these few incompetent medical professionals, as with the system used to identify the few incompetent teachers and remove them from the profession, is destroying the practices of the others in the profession. This search and destroy policy in medicine and education is hurting the huge numbers of hardworking, dedicated, and competent professionals in both medicine and education. Dr. Offrey goes on to say that the statistics she receives cannot possibly capture the totality, the totality of what it means to be a good, uh, to take good care of your patients. And because the reports do not capture what she does, they have not made her a better physician. The reports, she says, just grind her down. From Dr. Offrey's lament, we see that it is possible to be a competent, perhaps even a great physician, and still not have the metrics that are used to evaluate her do anything but report her as a failure. Her argument is that physicians like teachers can affect and save the lives of patients and students while not being judged highly competent by the typical metrics we use. Something else about medicine and education is also worth noting, namely that major changes in the metrics we use to judge each field are more likely to have their origin in what happens out of the office and out of the classroom than from what happens inside the office or inside the classroom. For example, longevity, one of the primary metrics we use to judge the medical profession, increased dramatically throughout the 20th century. But this increased longevity was not due primarily to our individual physicians. Longevity was extended by changes in public health, events quite separate from any skills my physician had, Waste treatment plants, indoor plumbing, particularly allowing for the washing of hands, x-ray machines, antibiotics, vaccinations, and other factors were the reasons for the huge increase in longevity. Out of the office factors, just like out of school factors, augment or limit the power of individual physicians and individual teachers to affect the metric we use to judge each profession, life expectancy or standardized achievement test scores. Let me describe how this works in education so you see uh, the power of these outside factors. On a reliable and valid standardized IQ test across one decade, 1930 to 1940, IQ scores went up eight points for a whole subpopulation of US children. That's quite a feat. How do you move a whole subpopulation up almost one point a year for a decade on a test that's supposed to be free of instructional and environmental effects, a test on which scores are supposed to be heavily dependent on genetic factors? These scores changed because of the confluence of a number of sociological factors outside of the school factors. The study I referred to is a classic in IQ measurement involving a large sample of Tennessee grade school children tested before the Tennessee Valley Authority was created in the 1930s and then after it had done its work a decade later in 1940. 
To build the large dams needed to generate hydroelectric power meant a large influx of educated city folks. Some people showed up in Tennessee who actually read the New York Times. And the construction of roads, which served to break the social isolation of rural communities. Perhaps the most important change was the introduction of electricity to thousands of rural homes. This allowed the people of Tennessee Valley to listen to radio for the first time, and in the evening, the electricity allowed for reading. These changes affected standardized test scores. Scores went up independent of what teachers did in classrooms, outside the school influence. Let's also look at another sociological change that promoted the opposite effect, a decline in scores. This happened after the closure of a GM plant in Flint, Michigan. This was poignantly and brilliantly described in the film Roger and Me, produced by Michael Moore in 1989. Flint was a thriving community in middle America. It was average in many ways, rates of home ownership, second home ownership, ownership of cars and boats. They had stable churches and families, modest crime rates, good schools. Flint residents had the dignity and the pleasures that working class and middle class people enjoy when they have economic stability. But the GM plant closed and Flint's crime rate skyrocketed. Shootouts, murders, and drug use became quite common. More reports that a crime became so prevalent that when the ABC news program Nightline tried to do a live story on the plant closings, someone stole the network's van along with the cables, abruptly stopping the broadcast. In fact, living in Flint became so unpleasant that Money Magazine named Flint as the worst place to live in America. To no one's surprise, schools did not thrive during this time period. They changed from working in middle-class institutions, with all that implies, to schools that serve the poor, the homeless, drug users, and children of drug users, children of divorce, and of chaos. Of course, school achievement suffered. When we judge the decline in the Flint, Michigan schools, are we seeing a school or a teacher problem? or a sociological problem. And if we agree that it is a societal problem, a sociological problem, then blaming the colleges of education for the teacher's inability to get high scores from the children of Flint is inane. So here's our paradox. Professionals in medicine and education are of enormous value to the individuals they treat or teach, but they are less of a factor in determining the metrics with which we use to judge our physicians and teachers. Physicians affect mortality, teachers touch eternity through their care of the individuals for which they have responsibility. The big takeaway from this is that the aggregate measures are not the least bit sensitive, um, are not the least bit of use in judging the individual. The aggregates, longevity and standardized test scores of students cannot and do not capture what physicians and teachers do. So my sixth point is that teachers affect individual students greatly in ways that teachers value and that families value but they affect standardized test scores very little. My proof for the first part of the statement is to ask everyone in this room if they remember a teacher that affected the course of their lives or the lives of their siblings or their children. Almost everyone does, and the effects were almost always positive. Not always. This life-changing or life-enhancing effect on individual students is documented beautifully in a book called Touching Eternity by my friend and colleague Tom Barone. Tom Barone had an interesting situation. He studied an exemplary teacher, a teacher in Appalachia and um, wrote about it, beautiful article in Daedalus on this art teacher and the teacher's effects on the kids. Uh, he, he just was amazed by them. But uh, about 20 years later, given the beauty of the web, he located about eight or 10 of those kids and he went back and interviewed them. Now we're talking about the long-term effects. What effect did Mr. I forget his name, Firestone or something. What effect did Mr. Firestone have on you, he asked them. And these eight or ten kids, all ten, eight or ten grown-ups now, all said he's in their lives on a daily basis or a weekly basis. They never stop thinking of him. And one of them said he sits on my shoulder. And every decision I have to make, I think, what would Mr. Firestone do? Now, that's the effect on the individual. Did he affect standardized test scores? No. Okay? So there's this paradox about what we use to judge our teachers with. Uh, Barone's book is beautiful. Um, these individual successes of teachers do not usually show up on the standardized achievement test that our secretary, our president, and your governor are asking us to use when judging teachers in colleges that train them. What about my other claim, of the, my statement, that teachers have little effect on standardized achievement tests? I can substantiate that by first noting that the year-to-year -year correlations of student scores on standardized achievement tests is quite high, often as high as 0.7 or 0.8. While that may indicate substantial reliability, which is good, 
It also indicates great stability in where students rank each year. That's bad if you are trying to judge a teacher effect on the students that they teach. With correlations from year to year this high, when we ask about the percentage of variation that we see in this year's standardized test scores, that's already accounted for by last year's standardized test scores, the answer is that somewhere between 50 and 65% of the variance in student test scores is already accounted for by what the kids had last year. Only about 35 to 50 percent of the variance in this year's scores is free to be affected by other factors like the competency of this year's teacher. Now, some of you are not familiar with the variance argument. Let me just make it briefly so you can follow along because I'll use it again. Imagine 10,000 student scores on a test. Then a whole bunch of predictors trying to see what predicts that variation. And then you figure out that uh, pa parental income picks up a piece of that variation. Uh, neighborhood crime rate picks up a piece of that variation. Um, the kind of uh, uh, whether parents have a college degree or not picks up a pick of that pick piece of that variation. And what you're doing is trying to say how much variation is left for the teacher. Okay. Well, when you have such high scores year to year on these tests, immediately 50% or more of that variation is taken account of by last year. So now teachers are only left with a small percent to work with. And I'll talk about how that works out too. School and classroom cohorts in the year that we do measure achievement affect standardized test scores greatly. In fact, the cohorts one goes to school with appear to be even more powerful than the standard sociological variables of type first uh, described by James Coleman 50 years ago. Coleman, you might remember, shocked us all by demonstrating what is now common knowledge to everyone but our Secretary of Education, which is that he found that teachers affect students' standardized test scores a lot less than do neighborhoods and families. More recently, Borman and Dowling, using more powerful statistical methods, reanalyzed the original data. They said it's not just parents and neighborhood, it's the cohort that's more powerful. The point is that neither um, uh, Borman and Dowling more recently, or Coleman 50 years ago, neither of them are giving much credence to the teachers affecting those scores. A reasonable estimate of how variance in standardized test scores is accounted for is from this diagram. What you have here is out-of-school factors in blue accounting for 60% of that variation in that pool of scores. You have unexplained variance. All social science measures have a batch of variance. We don't know what causes it. That takes care of about 20% of the variance. And then you look at classroom effects and school effects. These are school effects independent of the teacher. They account for about 10%. And the teacher's left over with about 10% of the variance accounted for. Now understand, under the Governor Cuomo's and Secretary's uh, uh, plan, you are going to judge teachers on this slice of all the variance. Makes no sense. Teachers are hardly affecting standardized test scores. OK, uh, who else says this sort of thing? Well, the American Statistical Association says the amount of variance accounted for is between 1 and 14%. That's all. That's pretty good, the American Statistical Association coming out on that. 10% may be about right. Um, what are all these other things affecting um, the variance? Out-of-school factors include percent of low birth weight children in the neighborhood, inadequate medical, dental, and vision care in the family and neighborhood, food insecurity in the family, environmental pollutants in home and neighborhood, and on and on and on. And all of these are picked up here. What about the school effects that are not, not under the control of the teacher? Class size, quality of the principal and other administrators, collective efficacy of the faculty, teacher turnover or churn at the school, etc. They're picking up. Um, this part, what we have is a tiny slice of those scores that we can attribute to teachers. And this is the basis for judging teachers and the schools of education that train them. This makes no sense at all. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. And... Uh, The variance accounted for argument, I, I had a couple of other examples, but I'll skip over them. I'm running out of time. The variance accounted for argument substantiates the sixth point that I made, that although teachers may have profound effects on individual students, they do not affect standardized achievement test scores very much at all. But there's more to suggest that standardized achievement test scores are inappropriate. 
My seventh point is that not only do we find that teachers are minor contributors to the test scores obtained, you got that here, but the effects they do have fade quickly. It turns out that a whole bunch of economists have looked at the effect of teachers this year on next year's test scores, second year test scores, and third year test scores out from when you tested them. Turns out that most of the effect of a teacher is gone in the second year, and by the third year, hardly any effect remains. So you're judging teachers on something ephemeral as well as a small piece of the pie. In other words, while we know from experience as educators and parents that teachers have long-lasting, maybe lifelong effects on individual students, we also know that their effects on the standardized achievement test of their students is quite small and likely not permanent. Ephemeral effects on tests and the VAMs derived from those tests should not be the basis of claims about either teacher or teacher education competencies. My eighth point is about the problem of evaluating teachers in the institutions that change them when we have conflicting data about whether or not they are poor or excellent. Let me skip a little of the pros and just make the point. We have a whole bunch of teacher uh, evaluation instruments. Every one of those instruments we have, we have dozens of them actually, but there's half a dozen in common use. Those are, can be reliably, uh, people can be trained to use them reliably, and every one of them makes a claim that they're capturing excellence in teaching. The Danielson program now is the uh, big one in the United States, the Charlotte Danielson's uh, observation instruments. The test scores that we get, according to the secretary and others, is what we can use to make a claim about teacher competency. Well, now we have two competing claims. If they correlated 0 0.7, 0 0.8, we would say, well, they're tapping the same construct. Correlations rarely exceed 0.3 and often are, often are about 0.2. Now, when you have correlations between two ways of judging teacher excellence and they don't agree, one or both of them is lying. Okay, you can't, you, you can't do that, okay? One or both of them is tapping something very, very different. So my question has been, as I went through this literature, why do we use the test scores as the criterion for validating the observations and say they're no good, they're not correlating with the test scores, instead of using the observations and saying the test scores are no good because they're not correlating with the observations? Why would you use a distal measure, the test scores, instead of a proximal measure, looking at the teacher's teaching? What is it that makes us choose the test and not the observations by a principal, say, or some other competent observer? The answer may be because um, of the money involved in the assessments, okay? So that's my uh, eighth point. Um, uh, in fact, I, I, uh, in the paper I say, if you really wanna learn who is and who is not a quality teacher and track the data back to the institution that trained them, the cheapest and easier way to do that is to ask a school principal. I have interviewed many principals, and every one of them has said they know who their strongest and weakest teachers are, and each had opinions about the institutions that train the teachers that are at their school site. They use informal classroom observations, reputational, me reputational measures, informal as well as, as well as formal student and parental surveys, and many use observational instruments that they are comfortable with to help identify high-quality teachers. I suspect, though they don't always tell me, that they use a lot of feedback from fellow teachers as well. As well. Teachers squeal on each other, you know, they really do. So we do know that principal ratings and standardized test scores are not always in agreement. I, I, I know that. Very often when VAMs are released in the newspapers, the principal goes, wow, I didn't know that teacher was a bad teacher because the principal had rated the teacher a good teacher. Well, why is the principal accepting the VAM instead of their own judgments? We, we have to think, rethink what's criterion and what's predictor in these two very different measures. My ninth point is related to work Jim Popham and I have done uh, across the years, leading us, to conclude, leading us to conclude that there isn't a single standardized test in the USA that has ever attempted to select items for instructional sensitivity. Not one. The items may reliably locate a student in a distribution of students based on how much those students know about this or that. But if you want to make an inference about a teacher's skill, you have to have an additional obligation uh, about your test. You have to have some evidence say that the difficulty level of the items on the test would be modified if good teachers taught the content that the items assess. It's likely that every item on the test had their difficulty level assessed before they made the final uh, uh, test to give to New York, New Jersey, wherever. Um, so if a good teacher provides good instruction, 
did the difficulty level of the item change? If you can't show that or demonstrate that, you can't make an inference about instruction. You can make an inference about the kids. You can't make an inference about instruction. So um, as long as no evidence about instructional sensitivity exists, uh, we can't make the inferences we want to make for the tests. My tenth point is about the closeness and distance of tests to the actual classroom instruction. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, three tests of students' knowledge after a unit of instruction by a teacher. Suppose one test is created by the teacher. Let's call that the close to instruction assessment. Suppose another test is created by a researcher, one who spends a lot of time in classrooms and, and, that they're familiar with and, and they know the curriculum uh, that's being assessed. Let's call that near to instruction assessment. And finally, suppose the same classroom is tested with a state or a nationally standardized test of some kind, and we call that distal or distant from instruction assessment, which might yield a larger effect of teachers on the measure of achievement. Well, it turns out that my colleague and friend, Barack Rosenshine, um, has studied that. So here's studies by Gersten and all meta-analyses uh, on mathematics for students with learning disabilities. And we have the standardized test, teacher effect, 0.10, and the teacher effect on the researchers' uh, test, 0.73. That is seven times greater sensitivity to teachers is shown on the researchers' test than the standardized test. We have the same thing here, 2.7 times greater sensitivity in studies. Uh, there were, I think there were 14 studies of reciprocal teaching. Um, all of these are meta-analysis. The one I want to point to is by Lou and all. Uh, they had um, a teacher effect on the standardized tests of under 0.1, but they had 0.34 on the researcher-developed tests, approximately five times greater, 0.07 to 0.34. But here's the big one. They actually found 16 classrooms where the teacher gave the test to, and that was 0.42. That's about eight or nine times more effect. So we're judging teachers on these, where the effects are small, instead of judging teachers on something more proximal to instruction, either the researcher's test or the uh, teacher's test. This finding is related to, uh, oh, well, these would be the close tests, not the near and not the distant from classroom tests, are the ones that produce effect size, on average, six times larger than those measured by standardized tests. This finding is related to a whole bunch of studies by Polakoff and his co-authors. They looked at the overlap of what was actually taught as determined from teacher logs and the items on standardized tests, the information that was tested. They found amazingly low agreement, which helps to explain why teacher effects on standardized tests are so small. So my tenth point is this. If you want to examine a teacher's influence on a formal test of achievement, you would be much better off using teacher-made tests. They more often reflect what teachers were able to accomplish in their classrooms than do the more distal standardized tests. Of course, teacher-made tests are all one-off, each unique, and almost always different from classroom to classroom. In addition, it is almost assured that those tests will be of less stellar reliability than the standardized tests. Thus, judgments about teacher quality derived from these teacher-made tests of achievement will need to be qualitative. These are, of course, the kinds of judgment the secretary and your governor is against. Apparently, both of them choose invalidity over reasonableness as a goal for the evaluation of teachers and institutions of teacher education. An 11th issue is related to the opt-out of testing movement, gaining in strength as I talk. Teach students and their parents in many school districts are choosing to opt out of the tests. Since we don't really know who they are, the test results become invalid. Okay? You can't make comparisons because in this classroom, the, the brightest kids went out. In this classroom, the poorest kids went out. Uh, in this classroom, it was somebody else. If you don't know that, you can't make the, the uh, case. A twelfth issue concerns the secretary's push for assessments for new teachers in particular. But given all the unreliability of the VAMs and the inadequate evidence, evidence of validity for the inferences made from the standardized tests or the VAMs, um, we'd likely find more false negatives than would be expected uh, among this group. False negatives meaning teachers who don't look as good as they might a few years later. It is generally accepted that it ordinarily takes around five years to develop expertise in teaching. Recent data suggests that teachers reach asymptote in their influence on student test scores in seven to ten years. 
So a judgment made too early in a teacher's career about competence, when based on standardized test scores, is likely to increase the rate of false negatives at a time when teacher recruitment is becoming a problem. So we're bouncing people out of the profession at a time when they haven't showed us what they're really capable of doing yet. That doesn't make sense either. I have made 12 points. Here they are. Let me get to my conclusion. Out-of-school influences are greater than teacher effects. Reliance on teachers can violate the legal and moral codes we said generally subscribe to. There are other acceptable sources of data for rendering judgment of quality. A testing culture promotes confusion between successful teaching and good teaching. In other fields, professionals are held harmless for lower success rates with certain clients. The paradox of teachers and physicians is that they often have large effects on individuals, but small effects on aggregate measures of their abilities. Teacher effects on standardized test scores fade quickly. Eight, for inferring validity, why do we use the test data instead of observational data as the criterion for judgments about teachers and the institutions that train them? Nine, no standardized tests demonstrate instructional sensitivity. Ten, teacher made tests show much greater Teacher-made tests show much greater teacher effects than do standardized tests. 11, the surge in opting out reduces validity even further. 12, testing teachers early in their career will inevitably increase false negatives among teachers and the institutions that train them. The other night I found 13 that there's something called the teacher spillover effect. A good math teacher will actually improve the scores on the reading teacher. Okay, a good reading teacher will improve the science scores. And while these effects are very tiny because these tests are not sensitive, you get 10,000 scores and they're real and they're statistically significant. So a 13th point that has to do with teacher spillover effects. You can now see why I believe that there is nothing to recommend using standardized achievement test scores or the VAMs that rely on them as the primary source of data for judging teachers or the institutions that prepare them. Sadly, this is not simply an issue for educators to solve. There are corporate interests involved in decisions to use standardized tests, even if used in invalid ways. The situation is similar to pharmaceutical companies pushing the use of drugs in ways not originally recommended. Off-label drug use and its equivalent, off-label test use, can result in a good deal of money being made by those pharmaceutical companies and our own testing companies. Students take an average of 113 standardized tests between pre-kindergarten and 12th grade. It is decidedly possible that not one of them can tell us much about the quality of teachers or the quality of the programs of teacher education from which they came. Pushing these tests into areas where the interpretation of the results is questionable requires that our profession fight back. The only way I know how to stop this invalid use is for three and a half million teachers to rise up and say, Hell no! If you intend to use these tests in appropriate ways, I won't give them. Use of these tests violates the standards for test use of the American Psychological Association, the National Council of Measurement on Education, and the American Educational Research Association. If you want to know how I'm doing, come on in and watch me. Watch me influence my students in ways that make sense. Watch me as I try to change the trajectory of a child's life as I attempt to touch eternity. I'm sorry it took 50 or so minutes to make my case, but I needed to document why I hold my opinions. A very simple summary of all I have said can be captured in just a few words that teachers and teacher training institutions need to rally around. Invalid metrics have to go. Thank you for listening. My name is Vikash Reddy. I'm a doctoral student here at Teachers College. Um, and my question is around sort of some of these more authentic assessments that you're talking about. Now, I think back to once upon a time I was a classroom teacher and I was pretty offended at the notion of being evaluated based on the test scores. But I think about my principal and, and I actually would say I trusted her less than the standardized tests. And so my question is, is on these more authentic measures, do you think we have in our nation's schools the administrative capacity, and not just the cost coverage, but the, right. the intellectual capacity to make those assessments and those evaluations of teacher quality meaningful and valid and reliable? Okay, the, the question is a very good one. Well, I, I already stated I would trust the principal and the observations over the more distal measure of student achievement. Uh, I do that fully knowing the imperfections of observers, uh, their unreliability, um, their uh, preferences, their, uh, I mean, we know the history of, you know, favoritism. Every corporation has bosses that favor this one and not that one, and every school has the same thing. Uh, human systems are imperfect. 
The question is whether you would rather rely on a metric that's invalid or a human system that's imperfect but could be made better. Okay, so that's my point. It's not that I'm going to say that every, t every principle can do the job you're, you're talking about. No, that's not true. But I believe they can be made better, and I don't believe the test can be made better for the inferences we want. That's my point. So good training of principles, superintendents that understand that in-service education of principles has to become a part of it, uh, states or, or, or districts that are willing to spend a little extra money for having multiple observers on multiple occasions in, board certified teachers are available, you, you pay their support in one district, they look in another district. What are board certified teachers doing? They're trying to make their profession respected. That's why they take that certification. They say, I'm good, I wanna show the world. Well, let them help but judge us, okay? So I think it's a matter of which is more perfectible. I don't believe the standardized tests will ever give us a better chance of having a good evaluation system than uh, working with the principals and uh, other observers. Someone else? earlier on. Yes. So um, why isn't there an in-between answer to that? Why does it have to be either the test scores or observation? I think neither is a particularly good measure of whether good teaching is going on. So what about some kind of assessment that really measures what you think should be happening? And could you even define what you think should be happening that would be good and what good teaching would look like to get to that? Well, I, I think you and I need to argue over that neither is any good. Um, uh, you know, qualitative judgments, uh, they're, they're imperfect, but we make them all the time. We judge our plays, we judge our symphonies, we judge our wine. Um, when I started out in my career, I thought Elliot Eisner, who became a close friend, I thought Elliot Eisner was crazy, uh, talking about connoisseurship in judging classrooms. Hey, he's nuts. I came out of behavioral psychology. I was closer to Thorndike than I was to Elliot Eisner. But you know, you age a little bit like the wine you like, and, and suddenly you realize that Maybe the only judgments you're ever going to make about quality are those based on your own standards of what constitutes quality. And the qualitative work I, I, I'm, I'm more impressed by. Um, so I, I don't want to reject it automatically as not being uh, good. But you make an important point. Um, I think, uh, I've come to believe that when I hear people talk about data-driven decision-making, I want to choke them, okay? <laughs> Data-informed decision-making is what I like. The data from standardized tests, we can talk about. We can hold a conversation. I don't want to fire you. I don't want to give you a reward. I don't want to take your VAM and, and, and do something strange with it. Um, I, what I want to do is have a conversation. If other things being equal, four years in a row, you're in the lowest 5%, you know, we got to have a conversation about, about your teaching performance. So it's not that they're completely useless. It's that they're usually useless, OK? Um, <laughs> What we need to do is, with any data set we have, is see if we can use them to hold intelligent conversations about teaching. So data informed decision making of the qualitative and the quantitative kind that lets us hold conversations. This is what we do with kids in classrooms. We take their tests, we take their portfolio, we take their writing assignments, and we have a conversation with them. And then we may on open school night have the conversation with the parents. We, we don't try to label the kid. This kid's you know, failing now, he's, he's done for. It's only the second week of the school year, but you're, he's done, get him out of here. Uh, we don't do that. So I, I think rather than say they're both bad, I'd rather say there's, there's information that we might hold conversations about in a world that was sane, okay? And uh, not looking for punishment on the basis of the evaluations. You know, if, if you're an experienced teacher with a few years uh, under your belt, you came from a pretty good teacher training institution, the chances of you being really bad is really small, okay? Now, teachers get tired. Some are a little too strict for my personality. Some are a little too lenient. Some don't know their math as well as I would like. But but bad, of the type that the Vergara case was about in California. Bad teachers, thousands of bad teachers, uh, just like thousands of bad physicians. They're, 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 they're like the welfare queens of Ronald Reagan's year, you know? There was one, okay? But he generalized so that there was the welfare system. Uh, we we got to make a, a, a change in how we think of bad teachers. It, it's just, they happen. They have to be dealt with. But... Um, 
I think we can do that with data-informed conversations and intelligent management systems. Not every principal is up to it, not every superintendent's up to it, but we have to start relying on them to, make, to help us make those decisions. That's where I put my effort in training. Somebody else. Hello, I'm interested in the, the concept you had of proximity to the classroom of the tests. Yes. And um, for many years, we had more transparency in New York. For our th grade three through eight tests, we, were, we got them back with item analysis. As an administrator, I found that enormously useful because I could plot teachers against test items and have a meaningful conversation. Right. I remember, and, and the, the New York State Regents have always functioned like that. I had. Right. You know, 37% of my kids couldn't solve a simple problem for slope, but I had one teacher who had all his kids solve for slope. Well, we have to talk to that There's teacher. There's a conversation. That's data-informed decision-making. So do you see any possibility of, of closing the gap of proximity with um, a more of a national curriculum driven by the Common Core so that the tests actually could become more instructionally sensitive. I, I think as long as we're denied access to the test items, it's not gonna work. But uh, do you have any thoughts? Because all of the data you shared is you know, before any hint of a national right. curriculum. Right, well the, the national, the, the two tests, the Smarter Balance and the Park, are gonna be closely tied to the standards, not the local curriculum, because they don't know what the local curriculum is. So they'll be tied to the standards, which means that teachers will start testing to the standards. Uh, as they interpret them. And uh, you're not going to get them back. They're going to be given in spring. You're not going to get them back till the fall. Um, they're almost useless to you. Uh, new kids, new teachers. Uh, teacher turnover rates are enormous in these, this day and age. So you're not, um, the stuff is not usable. But again, if you had a, a steady group of teachers and you got the chance to look at some of the items, if they'll let you look at them, that would be the basis for conversation. When No Child Left Behind began, uh, a guy named Christensen in uh, Nebraska des designed tests. The teachers designed the state test. The teachers scored the state test. And he paid the teachers to hold discussions about what those scores mean. Now, that's a rational system to get better. OK? They fired him. OK? <laughs> so uh, your, your instincts are quite right and how we develop a system that allows us to use information to get better at what we do. Here's, a, here's an issue on slope. One teacher's getting 100% right, one teacher's getting zero. Chances are they left it out of the curriculum because they didn't understand slope. That's what happens, okay? Well, then you need to teach that teacher how to teach slope. Um, conversation, data, data can be used for conversations, but you really have to trust it if you're gonna use it for hiring, firing, rewards, and that sort of thing. And I don't trust the data enough for that. Yes. Hi. So you had a really strong analysis of why we got the manufactured crisis after a nation at risk. This sounds like a manufactured solution, the value added. And I'm wondering if uh, your explanation, your understanding of why we have this has changed any from what happened 30 years ago. Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought it through. Um, I, I think the forces that were condemning education from a nation at risk on um, were less about um, the econometric uh, view of the world. Uh, they were just nasty people then, okay? Now we have not only nasty people, but economists. <laughs> and the, the VAMs uh, are, are, are the, the economists Take this all, you know, they use data sets in ways that the rest of us are going, wait, well, you know, that's, that's really not a good idea. But they don't care because they're using the large data sets. Half of them have never set foot in a school. And um, so we're getting a different group of people using the data in a different way, I think. So they're not, I don't find the economists nasty, like I found uh, Bill Bennett and the people who did Nation at Risk. Um, uh, the economists are not nasty. This is the way they think. They think the scores they're looking at correspond to life in classrooms. And that's a leap that most of us who've been in classrooms know is more tenuous. So I think it's the, um, it's the takeover of America by uh, worship of metrics that we see since a nation at risk. 
metrics. I talked to one of the classes today. Uh, America is in love with metrics, you know? Uh, we, we, you know, on, on the front page of U.S. News and World Report is that little factoid, uh, um, uh, 180,000 Americans wear to pace. Well, who cares, okay? <laughs> but there's a number and a fact, and we think it means something. But facts devoid of lots of other things don't. And I think what we're seeing is this worship of metrics in sports. Uh, winning and losing, okay, like our schools or like PISA tests, uh, winning and losing, and there's scores you can attach to that. So as we become more sports crazy and the business community becomes more influential and they use these metrics to judge productivity, and we have the economists who are at home with these metrics, we're getting a, a, a different cut at how to judge our schools, and it's not the humanistic one. And they will say, well, so what? And I think I'd rather say to them, well, we lose something precious when we lose that more humanistic view of our schools. You're welcome. So I have the just a speculative impression that among people like Andrew Cuomo, who seem to have such faith in test scores and want them, and for example, what? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, close. <laughs> um, I, I just have the impression that among people who believe in test scores and want that to be a big part of education policy, that maybe not consciously, but um, there seems to be a feeling among these teachers, uh, sorry, among these policymakers, um, that I just have the impression that, that some people feel like it's too hard to fire a teacher and somehow these test score metrics are going to like be a lever to get through that somehow. Um, and so I'm wondering if you agree with that, that it's too hard to fire teachers um, and whether or not you agree um, what do you think is, is an appropriate and helpful way to, um, to manage a, a school, the staff in the school, in a school? Um, and I just want to put one little opinion out there, and that is I would um, claim that this is not to do with unions because this seems to be a pattern across the country. Yeah, states Arizona, that do, Arizona has no unions. But it seems the like thing. the... Um, employment patterns are similar whether or not they're unions. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, okay, the, the, the issue, first of all, we have to talk about whether it's hard to fire teachers. That's the, um, th that's the case always made. Uh, that's the case in New York always made. There are 100 teachers in a rubber room doing nothing a day because nobody can fire them. The chief counsel for New York City came out and said, if a principal gives me a good case, I can fire teachers quickly. So the blame was put on those principals for not doing their job well. And the chief counsel, I mean, I, I, read, I read it in the Bible, the New York Times, that, uh, that, that they, they said, we don't have a problem. My wife was a school principal. The minute this issue came up, I said to my wife, were you able to fire teachers? She said, well, of course. Easy, you know, but you gotta document it. They're entitled to due process, but it's not real hard to get rid of them. And it turned out in the Vigara case, when we talked to lots and lots of principals in the uh, California case about tenure, uh, they all said, yeah, it, you know, it's a pain, it's hard. Uh, most of us don't like to face it, but it's not really difficult if we do our job and document it. So um, a little bit has to do with the human thing. I've worked in factories, I've worked in corporations. There's a lot of people there that aren't fired either, okay? Okay, uh, somebody's girlfriend, some drunk who's the cousin of somebody who's a manager, they're protected, they're stayed in place. It's almost human nature not to confront this issue. And so we need our principals to be stronger and say kids' lives are at stake uh, figuratively, and we need to be sure that we get teachers fired who can't deliver after a couple of years. And again, the issue is after a couple of years. If you offer people training, if you say the, the data suggests you're not doing your job well, um, that's all I'm saying is it suggests that, but here are some ways we think you can do it better. And you give people a chance to do it. That's, a, that, that's the system uh, I think I would admire. Um, so, um, the charge that it's impossible to fire teachers, 
is not substantiated by every good principal I ever talked to. Okay? Weak principals can't fire teachers. We have to help the weak principals. That's the superintendent's job. Okay? So we have to bolster them because the lives of kids are at stake, at least figuratively. Anyway, that's uh, not a great answer to you, but it's the best I have. And it's time for a, oh, we got one more question. Okay, then we'll go have a glass of wine because I'm ready. I have one question. Get as close. You talk about, as you talk about the role of the principal in firing teachers, do you have any data of the difference between first and second year teachers and third year teachers in the VAMs and more experienced teachers? Um, on the VAMs, I don't recall that. I've written on the VAMs, uh, particularly about how endogenous variables affect the VAMs in the Teachers College uh, record. Um, but we have data on, um, on test scores by year of uh, uh, teaching. And I published 20 years ago a, a curve that goes up for seven straight years on test scores in Texas with a million kids and 10,000 teachers. Scores rose for seven years. The economist Helen Ladd just published in North Carolina with another uh, million or so cases of, of, of data set of, with a million kids and again thousands of teachers. She says teachers get better at producing this over 10 years and they, then they ask them to. Uh, every teacher you talk to from Teach for America and uh, our own teachers out of the university they say their first year is really tough, their second year is um, difficult, but okay. Uh, one of the questions I asked when I studied uh, teacher expertise, the question I asked was, when did you stop being surprised by things that happened in your classroom? Okay. That, was, that was my question. And almost all teachers would say third year, sometimes fourth year, but by the third year, they've kind of nailed it. They know what to expect of crazy parents, of difficult kids, um, uh, of a principal they don't like, or whatever. Third year is when you're not surprised. So that's a pretty good qualitative measure. Uh, our evidence was that it takes about five years to become an expert teacher. Um, if you're going to become an expert teacher, it's about five years to show the kinds of behaviors that we judged ex uh, indicative of expertise. So uh, people are gaining. And uh, one of the reasons, oh, I do know an answer to your question. The New York City VAMs that, um, sorry, can't remember his name. He published um, the VAMs and he showed this incredible array of scores one year to the next. Uh, correlation of only about 0.3. But what he did was reanalyze the thousands of VAMs for New York City, just looking at the VAMs for first year and uh, for first year to second year teachers. Because he expected that second year teachers, if the VAM was any good, it ought to be capturing what we know to be common sense and anecdote after anecdote that second year teachers are better than first year teachers. They tell you that. Okay? They, they, there's a zero correlation. So um, it didn't show up on the VAMs. I forget his name now. He was with Gary Rubenstein, anybody? Rubenstein, right? Sorry, it came slowly. Gary Rubenstein did the study, and he just culled out of the thousands the 790-something that were first to second year, and they weren't showing the increase, which means either there is no increase or the VAMs are not sensitive enough, which I think is really the issue. Anyway, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for letting me try to... Give my opinions. <laughs>